Welcome to the University of Sydney Business School. Tonight, we're having a masterclass from the Master of Logistics and Supply Chain Management. My name is Dr. Geoffrey Clifton. I'm a senior lecturer in transport and logistics management here at the University of Sydney, and I'm the program director for the Master of Logistics and Supply Chain Management. I've been asked to talk to you tonight about building resilient supply chains. There's obviously been a lot of interest in supply chains and resilient supply chains during this COVID crisis. Now, as the lockdown is winding down in many countries, it's time to think about what supply chains have done during this time and what supply chain managers need to think about into the future. This has been a big challenge for society, for businesses and for ordinary people. And I'm sure many of you have also experienced difficulties during this time. Fortunately, supply chain management is one of the lenses we can use to think about how we can respond as a society to minimize the impacts and to minimize the risk that something like this will happen again. We'll start tonight by talking about supply chain management and the then I'll talk a little bit about the Master of Logistics and Supply Chain Management and give you a bit of overview of what we do in terms of teaching here at Sydney University. If you've got any questions, then uh, my colleagues, uh, Karen, is able to answer them during the presentation, or I'll talk to you afterwards uh, during the Q&A session that we're running at the end of this presentation. So you've got some buttons, you can press Q&A button, you can press if you've got any questions. And this evening's class is also being recorded. All of our master classes are being recorded, so you'll be able to find this online later on. Um, my email address is also at the end of this presentation. If you've got any other questions, please feel free to contact me. So, tonight's agenda. I want to talk you through what happened during the COVID crisis in terms of supply chains. What's happening now? And a little bit about some of the, what we're thinking might happen in the future, plus how we can respond. Now, many of you may not have heard of the term supply chains or logistics. These are terms which have a lot of different meanings depending on which part of the industry you're working in and whereabouts in the world you're located. But basically, Logistics is all about getting things done. And that means from production through to distribution, getting a product from the raw materials all the way through into the hands of the end user. And then even we talk about reverse logistics where we reverse the process and bring those goods back again once they're, being, once they're finished with. So recycling is a form of reverse logistics. Supply chain management is often defined a little bit more broadly than logistics, it includes things like the procurement task, things like um, designing products can be considered part of supply chain management. Basically, it's managing how goods and services are produced, distributed, and end up in the hands of consumers. It's a challenging industry, but it's a very enjoyable one. As we work with people in finance, we work with people in marketing, we're involved in all sorts of different activities. I've got a good friend who works for one, a big uh, piano manufacturer and he's their supply chain manager and he's always doing interesting, fascinating stuff. Sometimes it's working in their warehouse or redesigning products or dealing with supply issues, dealing with returns, dealing with customer distribution. I think it's an interesting industry. So, Let's start by having a think about what happened during the COVID crisis in relation to supply chains. Well, as many of you will be aware, one of the things that was really important was the need to get medical supplies where they were needed. And that was a big challenge. Most of the medical supply chain industry has long-term plans for things such as flu pandemics, but this turned out to be a lot bigger and a lot more serious than your ordinary flu pandemic, which meant there was a need for a lot more medical supplies much more quickly than was anticipated. Now, I think the industry did a fantastic job, and I'm not just saying that as someone who teaches logistics and supply chain management, I'm 
speaking here as a person who you know, uses face masks when he goes out shopping. Um, I think the industry did a great job in getting those medical supplies to where they were needed very rapidly. There were some teething issues, of course. There was instances where the supplies were in the wrong location or different countries were competing for the same resources. And it did take a while for manufacturing to ramp up. But I think the industry has done a lot to respond quickly. We talk about that in terms of agility, supply chain being agile, meaning able to react to changing circumstances. And there's been a lot of work done on building agile supply chains over recent years, mainly around changing or responding to changes in demand, particularly around new products, new technologies. The next thing that happened was that demand surged. And here's a picture from Australia of some um, people buying a heck of a lot of toilet paper. I think you would have to argue that that was probably too much toilet paper, or I don't know where they would have put it all once they bought it. But that was one of the first things that a lot of people noticed was panic buying, as they call it. Some of this was not so rational, I'd have to say. And there's a news story down here of um, someone who tried to get a refund on 132 packs of toilet rolls and 150 liters of hand sanitizer that they'd purchased is hoping to on sell it. I think that was probably not very sensible as it turned out because after all people are still using pretty much as much hand sanitizer and toilet paper as they, they ever was. Maybe a bit more hand sanitizer. Some of it was very predictable. So more people at home meant more people using the internet. Demand for the internet went up very rapidly and people moved from working in offices to working at home. So that meant a change in the demand for telecommunication services. Other things were also quite rational. More people at home meant more people baking bread and cakes. People eating lunch at home rather than eating out meant more demand for loaves of bread in supermarkets, less demand for the wholesale catering industry, for instance. All of that was a big challenge for the retail industry in particular to deal with. They had to up the amount of um, stock very rapidly. And some of that meant bringing um, goods through the supply chain quicker than they would have expected to. So the toilet paper manufacturers in Australia ramped up their production quite drastically. Uh, in other cases, it meant looking for new sources of supply. So anybody who's been to a supermarket in Australia you might see some, recently, you might see some unfamiliar packets of pasta on the shelves from some unfamiliar brands from elsewhere in the world that were, were brought in because they had spare capacity. In other cases, it meant having to change the, um, well, change the amount of stock on the shelves. So a lot of supermarkets reduced the number of different products they were selling or the number of different product lines they were carrying to concentrate on making sure there was enough of the essentials. We also saw something that we haven't seen in Australian supermarkets for many years, and that's rationing, where supermarkets said, well, we'll only sell a limited quantity so that everybody can make sure they get enough stock. And that had to be done quite rapidly. All of the plans of the in industries had to be rejigged very quickly. So the toilet paper industry, they'd have planned on producing so many rolls at, per week, and they would have been planning on packaging them in packs of 20 or 10 or five or whatever they would normally sell in. But suddenly they had to change that very quickly. They had to go from producing large packets to smaller packets so everybody could get, get some. And that was a big challenge for a lot of the industry, but one which I think the industry coped with quite well in the end. In other cases, demand slumped. So shipping, for instance, has experienced a large downturn in demand. And my colleague, Professor Mike Bell, who teaches our maritime units, been talking to his students about just that issue, all the different ways in which demand for shipping has changed in the last couple of weeks. Aviation demand changed. 
so no one was flying, which meant that a lot of the um, airlines had to stand down their employees. For the logistics and supply chain management industry, that meant that a lot of the air freight capacity was out lost from the market. The freight airlines, the dedicated freight aircraft, were still flying, but the passenger airlines, which carries a lot of air freight, weren't able to operate. Demand for oil dropped. In fact, at one point, they were giving oil away. It was that cheap. The purchases of new cars fell. Obviously, the hospitality and tourism industry suffered as well. And a lot of retailers shut down. In Australia, a lot of that was voluntary. Yeah, it happened before the um, restrictions came in. In other places, the restrictions came in first of all. So some of this was government issues that we're dealing with. That's all had a big impact on suppliers. For instance, companies who purchased their oil on the spot market, oil went from being a very scarce resource and something which needed to be very carefully managed to something which they could um, use a bit more freely. So in cases we've seen shipping switch from going through the Suez Canal to in some cases going around the Cape of Good Hope around the bottom of Africa, because that turned out to be cheaper to do that because you weren't paying the toll for going through the Suez Canal. Whereas in the past, the um, produce needed to get to the market quickly, it was worth a lot, and the oil was so expensive that it made sense to go through the Suez Canal. And as a result, the Suez Canals dropped their prices. We also saw supply chains responding through social distancing. Most supply chains were able to adapt quite straightforwardly. There's usually only a few bottlenecks where social distancing was a challenge. That's at some point in the supply chain where it was a bit harder to keep social distancing. Many factories were able to operate with social distancing, though in some factories, workers were closer together and they needed to do things a bit differently there. In the Australian industry, we saw a few issues around loading and unloading trucks. Whereas in the past, you may have had two or three people working on that. It had to go down to one person. Here's an image from the United States of a truck driver who was issued with a face mask. So what's happening now in the industry? Well, we're seeing a big change in the distribution channels. So where people are buying their products, how people are buying, and what people are buying has changed. On the screen, you can see a basic box. So Woolworths is one of our big supermarket chains here. And as soon as the COVID crisis lockdown went in place, there was um, fears for older people, particularly going to the supermarkets that might not be safe for them. So they came up with this basic box a box of essential goods and being an Australian supermarket, Vegemite is part of that essential products, uh, which they would ship out to customers. It was sold for cost price, these, uh, about I think, um, not sure exactly how much, and they shipped it through the mail or um, parcel delivery channels. And they, you're able to purchase that online if you're an older person and, or someone living with a disability, and that got the asset, made sure the essentials got into the hands of people who needed it. Where people are buying has changed drastically. We knew that online retail was a growing in industry and it's been growing rapidly around the world for many, many years, as I'm sure you're all aware. But with this lockdown, suddenly people are buying things that they never thought they would have bought online before. I know my online purchasing has increased quite a lot. In fact, I'm just sitting here next to me are some things which I purchased online just recently. Yeah, some books and some uh, teaching aids. I also bought some IT equipment online. So that's a change in where people are purchasing and how they're purchasing. We also saw a large change in what people are buying. People are not going out as much. So in a lot of cases, you know, clothing purchases have re been reduced. Uh, people are a bit concerned in some cases about their jobs and so they're switching to more of the basics rather than the luxury goods. On the other hand, if you're not going out to a restaurant on the weekend, 
you may be able to then afford to buy some more luxurious um, groceries at the supermarket. So oftentimes we see an actual growth in the sales of luxury grocery items. So different companies have reacted in different ways and they're experiencing differences in um, demand for their products. In fact, my friend who I mentioned works for the piano company, his companies, show, he showed us his warehouse the other day and uh, it was almost empty. There was a lot of sales had taken place in the recent times. So, you know, a lot of things are happening in the industry. And what that means is it's very hard to predict exactly what will happen next. And as you learn, if you study logistics supply chain management with us, or if you learn any logistics and supply chain management is that understanding the future, particularly demand forecasting, is the bedrock of all logistics and supply chain management. That's the essential ingredient that ensures that companies or enterprises are able to deliver the right product at the right time, the right price, in the, in the right place to the right people. Without good demand forecasts, logistics and supply chain management becomes very difficult. And that's what we're dealing with at the moment in a nutshell. Demand is very uncertain. The experts that I've been speaking to have told us that it's going to take a few months, in some cases years, for them to get confidence again in their demand models. So understanding what's happening and being able to rapidly respond to it is an essential skill for a logistics and supply chain manager. Last mile delivery has also become very important. We were expecting this because we were talking to our colleagues in China who'd experienced the lockdown first, and they told us about the great growth in last mile delivery in China. So we we're expecting that, and it's taken place around most of the world too. If you're not familiar with the term, last mile delivery is exactly what it says. It's that last mile getting the products to the customer. In days gone by, that might have been you drove to the shop, picked it up, um, and that still happens, of course. We're also seeing growth in um, delivery through of parcels purchased online. And here you can see a food delivery person bringing um, takeaway food to people. Australia Post, who handles a lot of the parcels here in Australia, added 600 casual staff and opened 15 processing centers because their uh, demand for their services went up by 90% within one month. That's an extraordinary growth and one which took a lot of work to handle. We also saw some new forms of collaboration, things I wasn't really expecting to see. So some of our artisanal gin distillers became artisanal hand sanitizer distillers. And you can now buy $20 hand sanitizers, which smell of cinnamon and uh, cardamom and, and various other spices. I'm not sure how much trade they're doing, but it was certainly a, a great example of an incredibly agile supply chain to go from making liquor or other chemical products to being able to manufacture hand sanitizer very rapidly. And I think being able to do that has generated a lot of goodwill for those companies. A lot of Bigger manufacturers quickly turned their attention to designing ventilators for use in hospitals. On uh, my screen, you can see one made by Dyson, who are best known for their fancy vacuum cleaners, and another one in the middle by General Motors, who make a lot of cars, of course. Both of those companies had never really been in the um, health manufacturing industry or ventilator manufacturing industry, but now they rapidly turned around and were able to prototype and start manufacturing these. As it turned out, there hasn't been the demand for those products that they were worried they would have been, but it's been an excellent um, example of co rapid uh, cooperation and agility in supply chains. So it's very good to see that. We also saw a lot of learnings being shared. And, uh, I've been on some conference calls with industry where they're talking about how they, what they've learned during this, what they've done differently, and sharing that information both within companies 
and with other people who may have been considered you know, competition in some cases. So companies who rapidly were able to change to an online model from physical distribution um, or from you know, physical stores. So that's been a big change. The next question is, of course, what are we going to see next? And if I knew exactly what we would see next, I probably wouldn't be telling you guys about it. Sorry, I'd probably be out there making a billion dollars being the next Amazon or somebody. But if any of you guys come up with what happens next, then please remember me and I'm, I'm always happy to join you. <laughs> Just a little joke there, of course. What we can say is that we're now looking for the new normal. We don't know exactly what the new normal will look like, but we know what questions to ask. Will the economies rebound quickly or are we going to go into a recession? This is a question which is essential for supply chain managers to be able to answer, right? because they need to know what the demand for their product is likely to be before they plan how best to produce it and best to distribute it. And in fact, even what products they should be selling. And that's where we need to talk with the, you know, the economists, business people, and so forth. Will consumers return to normal buying patterns? My suspicion is that in some cases they will, but in other cases, people who've had a taste of online shopping are likely to stay there. I know speaking to people that a lot of people who've tried online supermarkets for the first time now find it very convenient and are going to keep doing it. I know my mother, for instance, who's never used an online supermarket in her life, used one for the first time, and, and now she uses that as part of her weekly shopping. Will we see a resurgence in, co in COVID-19? If we do, that's gonna have big impacts on social distancing in the future and on demand and supply. Hopefully that doesn't happen, um, but that will depend probably on how quickly a vaccine can be developed and not only developed, but also distributed. Some of my colleagues are working on vaccine distribution challenges and looking at new ways of distributing vaccines. They weren't looking at that in terms of the COVID vaccine, but I'm sure they'll be looking at that now. People are talking about the end of just in time. Now, just in time is something that we love talking about in supply chain management. That's the idea that you get your supplies in just in time. So as soon as you run out of whatever it is that you use as an input into your manufacturing, maybe you know, um, screws or nails or, or whatever you're using, that you get the new supply in straight away. So as you finish one bucket, a new bucket comes down and it's ready to go. That's been great for a lot of industry. It meant they had, could reduce the amount of inventory they had. It meant they were able to be much more agile, but it comes at a cost. You have to be very good at predicting your demand and your supply if you want to use just in time. Otherwise you run the risk of not being able to satisfy your customers if demand surges, or if there's a problem in your supply. In the last couple of years, we've seen quite a few natural disasters, some fluctuating transport costs, some trade disputes, which mean that the cost associated with implementing just in time can often outweigh the benefits. In fact, we saw many countries imposing restrictions on the export of medical supplies and other essential items during the COVID crisis. All of that makes just in time delivery much harder to manage. So we may well see a change in just in time or how it's used or how often it's used. It's also talk about less globalization, more regional trade and some new trade networks. At the moment, some of the experts are telling us that globalization has lost momentum, but regional cooperation, regional manufacturing is likely to increase as is demand for short sea shipping. We're also likely to see more diversification in trade with companies not relying on only one country as a source, but maybe relying on a multiple or a portfolio of different countries. And that will create new opportunities as well. Biosecurity. 
most people would never have used the word biosecurity before 2020. But now I'm tipping that biosecurity is going to be one of the chief risks, one of the chief challenges that supply chains are going to be working on over the next few years. That means ensuring that their supply chains are not affected by future outbreaks or minimizing the impact of a future outbreak. To understand this, we need to consider some of the risks that live in supply chains or that exist in supply chains. There's a supply risk, a process risk, demand risks, and also sort of corporate level risks. I'm not going to talk much about the corporate level risks. That's sort of the, the um, that's handled elsewhere in the business school. But I will talk a bit about some of the supply chain risks, process risks, and demand risks just quickly. A supply risk, well, classic supply risk would be your supplier going bankrupt. For example, Apple relied on GT Advanced Technologies to deliver its um, sapphire glass. They were supposed to be the exclusive supplier for Apple, but they went in bankrupt very quickly. That meant that Apple was left without a valuable product to, um, feature in a very competitive smartphone market. That was a classic example of supply risk. It doesn't have to be as extreme as that. It could be just that um, the supplier is late or, or unable to deliver the quantity they promised or the quality that they promised. Process risks. Well, that's a risk to a particular process within the supply chain. There's lots of examples of that, but I'll just give you one on terms of transport risks. Transport is obviously a very important process Yes, it's the movement of the goods within the supply chain and to the end user. If a transport network is disrupted, that creates a risk for the supply chain, meaning a risk that they won't be able to get the goods to the customers when they want them. So we saw some, oh, two kinds of things at the moment. One was the loss of air freight capacity that I already mentioned. That was a big downside disruption to transport networks. On the other hand, the drop in oil price was actually a positive risk. As it turned out, it was an upside risk, meaning that um, price of oil has dropped, so a lot of transport will become a bit cheaper, assuming they've still got the capacity. So, those are supply risk and process risks. The demand risk, we've already spoken about the difficulty in understanding exactly what demand is going to look like at the moment and the short-term fluctuations that we've experienced. Some of the strategies to minimize risk that we talk about. Well, diversification is a good one. Resilience, sustainability, and agility. And I'll talk about each of those in turn. So diversification. Diversification means changing your supply base, using multiple suppliers to allow rapid shift if one supplier is disrupted. What we found out, most companies have a backup supplier just in case their main supplier runs into difficulties. But what we found was in a lot of cases, companies had a backup supplier who was located in the same city as their primary supplier. And so when that city went into lockdown, both their main supplier and their backup supplier were unable to fulfill their orders. Or both the backup and the main supplier used the same second tier supplier. So they were getting their raw materials from the same group. So that was an issue. If you can make your supply chain more flexible by using multiple suppliers, you may be able to reduce some of the risks. Make and buy is a strategy. That's where you control your own manufacturing. So you make your own products that you sell, but you have the ability to buy in as required. And that can help you to overcome some um, demand fluctuations or some supply shocks. Increasing the range of products or services offered. For many years now, management consultants have been recommending that companies focus on one or two core businesses that they're really good at. But that does have risks. Increasing the range of products and services that you offer can help to mitigate some of those. Modular design or postponement, another ways of helping to build resilience. Postponement means delaying the final production until demand is better known. 
A good example there is a computer. So when you purchase a computer from an online retailer, such as Dell or Acer or one of those companies, they've got most of the production already done, but then they're able to customize it to your exact specifications. So you get the computer you exactly want, and then it's shipped to you. That means that they're not committed to a particular um, make or a particular um, model of computer until the last minute. Modular design means that parts can be more interchangeable. So creating standards across an industry, for instance, so that you can work with a number of different suppliers. And more safety stock. Safety stock is the inventory that you hold just in case something goes wrong. Just in time is the opposite. That's holding no safety stock and hoping nothing goes wrong. We're also seeing more contingency inventory, which is again, a kind of like safety stock. Um, and there's a view from some people in the industry that Wall Street, that the finance companies, the shareholders are going to expect to see more resilient supply chains, ones which are better able to cope with changes. Digitalization. That's also accelerated the uptake of automation and remote control technology, which means that people are able to work from home and still do the jobs, which used to take place um, you know, at the docks, it used to take place in the offices of shipyards um, and warehouses and so on. As a result of digitalization, though, more of that can be done remotely and with um, physical distancing, social distancing, which is the key term. And digitalization can also help with agility. That's the ability to shift your supply chain rapidly as things change. And I think agility is one of the key components of a resilient supply chain. All of these strategies though involve additional cost and additional management time and effort. And that may well reduce what we call economies of scale. Economies of scale of what have driven a large part of the economy, or the greater economy, a large part of manufacturing for many years. That's the idea that if you manufacture in bulk, you save money. That's why companies grow by buying out their competitors, is to grab those economies of scale. Reducing the average cost to serve by producing more items at scale. If that goes away, then we may see a uh, shift back to local manufacturing, to smaller scale manufacturing. Of course, digitalization and 3D printing, which you'll learn about if you study with us, are technologies which do help that. Um, if there aren't great economies of scale, then those sorts of new techniques can be very useful. Well, that's the end of my presentation. I'll go through now a little bit about who we are and then we'll have and what we teach and then we'll have time for q and I'm looking forward to hearing what questions you guys have come up with during this presentation. So I work for the Institute of Transport and Logistics Studies within the University of Sydney Business School. We're recognized as a key center of excellence in transport and logistics research and education by the Australian government. We've got very strong links with industry. I've spoken a little bit about that at, um, tonight, both in transport, logistics, infrastructure, supply chain management, aviation, maritime, um, with a big emphasis on logistics and supply chain management. We offer what's known as the Master of Logistics and Supply Chain Management. And the idea behind that is we teach the specialist skills in applying some of these concepts, techniques, and principles that I've mentioned to really help develop the capabilities of the logistics and supply chain management industry by improving the capacity, the human capital of the workers in the industry, particularly the managers, people who have recently moved into management roles or are looking to move into a management role. We offer a couple of different programs. Well, the main one we offer is the Master of Logistics and Supply Chain Management. That's a one and a half year full-time degree. You study 10 uh, units which are 10 subjects with us. And you do a capstone project, which I'm teaching at the moment, where we get our students to work with industry and to meet with industry 
and to work on a particular industry problem. So you're acting almost, um, well, it's as close to being in the industry as you can get while still being at university. We also offer the Graduate Diploma in Logistics and Supply Chain Management. That's a one-year full-time degree. He, um, you study the, uh, six units in that, or the Graduate Certificate in Logistics and Supply Chain Management, which is uh, half a year full-time or four units of study. Now, the Grad Dip and the Master of Logistics and Supply Chain Management are open to everybody, international students and domestic students. The graduate certificate is only open to domestic students at the moment. And, um, and all of these can be studied either full-time or part-time. If you're working full-time, we'd recommend that you take one or two units a semester at most um, and work your way through. They also stack. So if you start in the graduate certificate, you can go on and complete another two units of study to finish the graduate diploma. Or if you start in the graduate diploma, now, you can then do an extra four units of study to complete the Master of Logistics and Supply Chain Management. So sometimes we find students start in the graduate certificate, they move on to the grad dip, and then the Master of Logistics and Supply Chain Management. And that's exactly the same as if you started in the Master of Logistics and Supply Chain Management. You do the same units in the same order, you're just starting out in one degree and finishing up in the other. So we also offer a few other courses here in the business school. Another one we offer is the Master of Commerce. That's a two-year degree for the semester two intake. Um, it's going to change a bit for 2021 um, and become a one and a half year degree. That will be starting from first semester next year. And in that Master of Commerce, you can study what's called a global logistics specialization. That doesn't have the supply chain management elements that you can only study in the Master of Logistics and Supply Chain Management, but it looks at a little bit about how um, logistics forms part of the business um, and part of general commerce. So that's a useful and interesting degree as well. The Master of MBA, we've got a couple of different forms of that. One's a full-time one, one's a part-time course, and that's aimed at managers, people who are already working in management or want to move up into a senior management role. The Master of Management for people who want to uh, work in management at a very high level to the CEO sort of thing. Master of Human Resources and IR, uh, in Master of International Business. Those are two more specialist degrees. And then the Master of Professional Accounting, which is a, another specialist degree that we offer. Why do I think we should study at the University of Sydney Business School? Well, not only just because I work here um, and that I've got some fantastic colleagues, but I think we are one of the best universities in the world. We're ranked number one in Australia and fourth in the world for graduate employability. We're ranked in the top 30 for accounting and finance, top 50 for business and management. We're the top 1% of universities in the world and ITLS is ranked uh, well above world standard in research in transport and logistics and supply chain management. And um, so you'll be studying with some of the best um, academics, I think, if you come and study with the University of Sydney. Uh, 